So building off of our last section where we introduced medical anthropology, I'm going to go into a discussion of the work of medical anthropologists. And this is also uh, draws heavily from Singer and Baer's uh, 2012 text that we're using for our class. So uh, the approach overall for this lecture will focus on uh, what Singer and Baer do throughout much of their uh, book is look at four individual case studies and show how those are illustrative of the particular key concepts that they flesh out over the course of the individual chapters and indeed through most of the text as a whole. Uh, Singer and Bear maintain uh, that there is a range of issues as well as specific foci within medical anthropology and that there's this distinctive medical anthropological focus uh, overall uh, in our uh, overall approach of anthropologists to medical issues. From here, I'll be going into a discussion of methods in anthropology and explicitly looking at how some of these methods are used in medical anthropology. Indeed, many of the journal articles as well as the ethnographies that we'll cover over the course of the semester will draw very heavily from these methods, will utilize these methods. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about my work with methods as well. From there, we'll go into applied activities of medical anthropologists, noting in fact that medical anthropology is of course more than anthropologists conducting research by themselves. So uh, Singer and Bear start out with four case studies. Uh, the first of these is from Harper's work in Madagascar and it looks essentially at the development of a national park and subsequent Ill, uh, increased rates of illness as well as death uh, surrounding the development of the park as a whole. The methods that Harper uses is a census, and this is very important uh, first off when you start in uh, many projects, is to try to get a sense of who is around. So who was in the particular village, uh, who is related to whom, uh, essentially uh, getting a, a sense of the community as a whole before going in and uh, working with the community. Uh, also engaged in participant observation. One of the key findings here uh, and this is, uh, I think, an important point to keep in mind when we're talking about ethnomedicine and particularly traditional ecological knowledge, that reliance upon traditional ecological knowledge is not um, necessarily a, a product of a, a um, clinging to tradition. But as Harper points out, the reliance on forced botany in this particular case was conditioned um, not by culture, but rather by social inequality. That is, these individuals were rather cash poor and they could not afford access to other types of medical uh, treatment as well as medicines. Uh, half a world away, Katz's uh, work in a Canadian hospital illustrates surgeon culture and looks at particularly how surgeons are trained and, and some of the barriers that go into or prevent training of uh, newer surgeons as they conduct uh, their residencies. And one of the key highlights here is the competition between surgeons and the real uh, issue of sharing information. And there's a, uh, there's a idea that the surgeons like to keep the information uh, close to themselves. They don't like to share any information that could potentially be compromising to their own careers and their own self-interest as a whole. There's some parallels here uh, in some other work in anthropology. Uh, George Lipsitz's work on competitive consumer citizenship talks about this in the context of individual citizens in the United States as well as uh, federal and state agencies, particularly federal agencies that are struggling uh, seemingly with one another over rather limited resources. So it's a very uh, uh, scarcity type model of uh, economics uh, being applied in a broader context. The idea that there will never be enough to fully go around for everyone. Uh, one of the key methods here uh, that differ, uh, differentiates is Katz's work is the idea of behavioral observation. So following these uh, surgeons around uh, in uh, for a series of weeks. Uh, and one of the things that come out of this that Singer and Bear maintain throughout the text, of course, is biomedicine as a type of ethnomedicine uh, that we'll talk about further in the semester as we talk more about ethnomedicine. And uh, it's uh, very much rooted in the cultural systems within which you find medical practitioners, uh, patients, to the extent that they become patients, uh, as well as beliefs surrounding 
illness, uh, disease, uh, wellness, and these sorts of things. And we, again, we'll develop this further as we go along in the class. Continuing on in the case studies, uh, Broden, Broden's work in Haiti looks explicitly at medical pluralism, noting that there are multiple competing systems of healing that people must choose between. Some of the methods that are employed by uh, Broadwin include participant observation as well as semi-structured interviews and attendance in formal meetings, which uh, personally I found it to be very rich uh, sites of information. Uh, and this is certainly uh, part of the flow of information in terms of uh, information about medicine, disease, illness, these sorts of things, and, and how various institutions position themselves overall in the exchange and flow of information. One of the key concepts that Broadwin talks about in the context of this, uh, of this uh, Singer and Bear summary of Broadwin's work is the issue of rapport with healers. And it, in anthropology, when we work with various populations, there's the importance of building rapport, building a sense of trust, the idea that individuals feel like they can share information with you and that you'll, you won't use it in a way that's inappropriate. Uh, so building and maintaining rapport is very important for anthropologists. Uh, in, in fact, um, anthropologists have talked very explicitly in the last uh, decade or so about the uh, about building rapport and some strategies to build rapport. I'm thinking particularly here of Gardner and Hoffman's work, uh, Dispatches from the Field. But some of the things that any anthropologist would use to build rapport would be speaking the same language as the individuals that you're working with, so having those language skills in place. But also the personal characteristics of the anthropologist, and sometimes um, you have the case where uh, there's not necessarily a meshing of those personal characteristics with the uh, culture as a whole and uh, uh, beliefs in, in the culture as a whole. Uh, and again, this is something that has to be maintained over time. It's not just, well, I've got rapport, I'm going to continue to have rapport. And then there's also the sense of balance between empathy as well as professionalism. So the extent to which anthropologists will become uh, as Speed refers to it as, as a, a type of activist, uh, engaged anthropology. Uh, but to, how, to uh, what extent can anthropologists do that while still maintaining their professionalism? So, uh, you know, if you have a particular community that there are, uh, that there is tension that exists potentially or limited resources that you have to distribute, you know, how will you make that, those decisions in an ethical manner? And again, much of this uh, anthropologists find out as they go. And again, um, Gardner and Hoffman's Dispatches from the Field talks about this fairly extensively. Uh, Spradley's work in Seattle, yeah, and Spradley has a, uh, a focus here uh, when his research ends up uh, looking at, Spradley's research ends up looking at, is looking to decriminalize public drunkenness. And so uh, as part of this, uh, goes out and talks to individuals about what they think uh, is going on. And the primary method that he's using here is ethnosemantic elicitation. And uh, in ethnosemantic elicitation, the intent here in, in the context of cognitive anthropology uh, is to look uh, very explicitly about how people themselves conceptualize the environment around them. So they're in how they organize knowledge and information. And so Spradley finds that for individuals that are uh, homeless or, or that uh, he refers to as urban nomads uh, throughout the, the work, that there are various discussions of different types of places to sleep uh, or what they would refer to as flops. And so uh, they would, of course, have a lot of different knowledge about this. Uh, one of the things that comes out here in particular is how the police in Seattle are um, treating individuals uh, who are who are drunk and, and how it's uh, criminalized and then uh, from this uh, this is this work that Smiley's research comes out the decriminalization of public drunkenness and I think that the, uh, the authors of the text Singer and Bear also highlight um, some of the same sort of issues with um, drug use uh, uh, and uh, 
what are, what, are, what are the ramifications of criminalization as a whole uh, versus treatment uh, for uh, individuals who are, are seeking assistance. And, and many times interventions of medical anthropologists, including research itself, may form as a, as a site of uh, intervention. So again, there's a range of issues as well as a specific focus that medical anthropologists have. Uh, they, they cover a wide range of issues across the entire uh, life course, all the way from birth and a singer and bear mode, even before that, if we're talking about reproductive technologies, uh, all the way through death. Um, so some of the work that's highlighted in the text, and again, and again, we'll be looking at other articles over the course of the class as well. Uh, Davis Floyd's 1992 work, which examines pregnancy uh, and technocratic birth, or what is the full medicalization of childbirth in the biomedical context. Uh, indeed, one of the um, individuals have talked about the very ritualized nature of coming into the hospital and then being put into uh, a wheelchair, for example, um, as a sick individual that must be treated. Um, uh, the, the pregnancy that the child must be uh, removed uh, during the process. And the, the David Sloy talks about this in, in the context of very uh, of these metaphors of, of, uh, of industrialization, essentially, this, this uh, technocratic birth. Uh, Van Esterick uh, has worked fairly extensively um, looking at, as well as other anthropologists and activists, to challenge the uh, commercial infant formula that was developed by Nestle. And as you can see here uh, with these photos, uh, widely marketed to, in, um, to individuals in countries where there were not good sources of water, where there was water that had not been properly treated. And again, so here there was a real risk for children overall. And so this was an example of where you had uh, individuals who were engaged to boycott Nestle uh, for some of this work uh, in, in a capitalist type of system and in opportunities to make money. And this was challenged by individuals overall. Uh, in addition to the work that work on the life course, uh, we see the work on aging and how this varies quite a bit cross culturally. Um, so, very broadly speaking, Singer and Bear highlight that cultures with a strong emphasis on tradition, uh, elders tend to have a lot of respect. They have a lot of authority uh, for the wisdom that they can impart on the younger generations. In turn, in cultures with an emphasis on modernity, with things changing very quickly. Uh, rather than being referred to as elders with a capital E, you know, old people or the elderly, um, again, cultural terms here, are likely to be viewed as out of touch uh, with society as a whole, and hence they don't really have anything to offer to uh, individuals, as, uh, uh, individuals in younger generations. Uh, two, in terms of cultural importance, the idea of risky behavior and condom use, and this is Sobo's work from 1985, uh, that good women can, in fact, trust their partner. Um, so uh, good women are seen to make good judgments about their partner. Uh, and in the context of primary sexual partners, uh, they can trust their men to be good and not to have um, sexual intercourse with other women without their knowledge. Uh, in turn, in the same cultural context, um, these men would see uh, sexual achievement as a marker of success in instances where they wouldn't necessarily be able to uh, achieve success in a wider economic context. And for further discussion of this, see Singer and Bear's work from uh, pages 58 to 61. So um, looking at medical anthropology in uh, focus, uh, some of the things that uh, are looked at is uh, addressing pressing health problems. This is the applied aspect of medical anthropology. Engagement of field work over long periods of time. Uh, one of the key aspects is to look at the instated, uh, the insider's point of view. These are stated attitudes as well as observed behavior. Uh, and this comes over time through long-term uh, work. Anthropologists, one of the key ideas in anthropology is that it's holistic as well as contextual. And this is something that's really fleshed out in ethnographic fieldwork, which is longer-term research, which allows for front stage performances of individuals to be dropped in order to reveal more hidden aspects of experience and social interaction. And, and again, Singer and Bear talk about this quite extensively in the text. So some of the methods in medical anthropology, um, today we're seeing a mixed methods approach. So this is a mix of both qualitative as well as quantitative methods. And again, you would get much more of this in the context of a research methods course or particular courses 
uh, that cover very specifically how to do a, an entire course, for example, on how to do behavioral observation. Um, so uh, there's quite a, a bit of information that's out there, and I'll get a little bit more into some of the details in the second part of this lecture.